Hi there. We are so glad you joined us today for this message. We hope you enjoy it. Kick back, learn about Jesus, and be blessed. Talk to you soon. All right. Anybody else? Okay. Well, God bless y'all. Lord, you know the prayers and you know the things that are needed. Uh, that was funny, Bobby. I, I couldn't, I, did, I lost you. You used to be so big, you couldn't miss you in the room. tiny guy now all right well uh there was uh the the kids are gonna go now uh thank you ma'am for taking them and let me know if they act up god bless your kids when you go uh deborah (laughs) All right, so there was this uh, church, and they had a, a gentleman who came, and he didn't have any arms, and he came and said, I've always wanted to, they had a big steeple with a bell, and he said, I've always wanted to ring the bell. He asked the, the pastor, would you allow me to do that? And he said, well, you know, we'll give you a shot. And he goes, I don't know how you're going to do it. He goes, the Lord's going to show me when I get up there. So he got up into the bell tower he just stepped back and ran face first into the bell bing and everybody was like oh my gosh never heard that bell sound so beautiful so then he backed up and he hit it again and uh, rang out everybody's paying attention now this is different it's a different sound than we've had before and then all of a sudden he backed up to hit it the third time and he missed it and he went right out the window down on the pavement in front of the church and died and the pastor went running out there and he said yeah. does anybody know his name I didn't get his name and the gentleman passed up, stepped up there and said I don't know but his face sure rings a bell That's not a true story. <clears throat> That's pretty good. A few minutes later, his brother came up, the guy who fell out, and he came up and said, he's a dead ringer from my brother. <laughs> that made it worse, right? All right. All right. God bless you all. Now, we are uh, finishing chapter 24 of Matthew. And uh, I entitled this uh, Inspiration for All Times. Now we see that he's been, Jesus has been speaking about the end times. And now he leaves us with an inspiration for all times, for all of us. And uh, so as we get into this, I hope that uh, it will speak to you all. And the class on Thursday, class on Wednesday, it's all just kind of winding together. And it's beautiful to see how it's working. Uh, If you're not here for every one of those, you'll get bits and pieces of it. But but for me, studying it and then delivering it is uh, is just an awesome message that there's no way that uh, man could put it together. Amen? So I'm going to go ahead and start on verse 42 of Matthew 24. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know What day the Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of the night the thief would come. He would have kept watch. And he would not let his house be broken into. So also you must be ready because the son of man will come at an hour when you do not expect him to. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whose master is put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for the servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. 
I tell you truly, he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. But suppose that the servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away for a long time and begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and an hour he is not aware of and he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the life that you put in us. We thank you for these testimonies. We thank you for the ones that are sick and having procedures and illness because we know how you heal us, Lord. We just can't wait for more testimonies about what you're doing in in your saints' lives. And uh, we just ask that you open our hearts to your word and let your spirit fall in this place. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So, <clears throat> we have, the way this is set up is in three parts. This first part is going to be watch, when Jesus is telling us watch. And the middle part is be wise. And the last part is you are warned. So as we get into this, I just want to, uh, I just want to encourage sometimes things like what things are uncomfortable for me sometimes and uh, like what happened on Thursday night I had to say something that was uncomfortable but the Lord puts us in uncomfortable places so that we can grow in character and that we can step out that we can learn uh, our limits because we don't know them actually don't. You think you do, but you really don't. God can do wonderful miracles with his people. Amen? So the very first verse here, uh, 42, and it says, therefore, keep watch, because you do not know what day the Lord will come. Now, we've gone over this as we've been going through this chapter and in other places and it says that no one will Jesus says no one knows the day not even him uh, when the Lord will return now that he's in heaven and he's been crucified and he sits with his father I'm sure he knows the day he is the word that will speak return He knows when he's coming back now. But while he was here saying these things, he didn't even know the time. So we don't know the time. But we try to figure everything out in our lives, you know. We try to figure out why this happened. What was the purpose for that? These things. And and what we don't do is we don't look back and go, well, that's why I moved to there. And that's why I lost that job, so I had to go to that place, so that I had to go here, that I ended up there, that I ended up right here where I'm at. When we look backwards, that's the things we should see. The Lord orchestrating things in our life to build our character, to build us up, to do His work. And sometimes we have to break some things down. It says that no one knows. But we're to keep watch. Because we don't know the hour. You don't know the day or the hour. So, let me just ask you. If I was to say, uh, do you believe that Jesus is going to come back within the next 60 minutes? What would you say? Yeah, we got all kinds of things we want to say. Uh, if you know and you believe that he is, then you're going to live your life like he is, right? If you're like, well, it's been too long, 
It's been a long time. I don't think he's coming today. Let's go to the bar. Let's go do this. You're going to live your life as though he's not coming back in the next hour. But, you see, you can train yourself to, to live your life as though he's not coming back because he hasn't yet. So what's cool is when you ask that question to someone, do you think he's going to come back in the next hour? That opens up for this whole uh, parable to be talked about, for this whole comparison that Jesus is doing to be talked about. If you're looking for a way to fit this into a conversation, there's your question. Do you believe Jesus is coming back in the next hour? And then... You can, you can dig into this. Just a tip. Okay, so I want to... Uh, we, don't, we don't know how much time we have. We don't know how much life we have. And I, I always say, you know, you're not promised tomorrow. And sometimes we can say stuff like that, so much so that it just bounces off, right? That we don't think about it. You know, or whatever. Okay. You wake up the next morning, and you wake up the next morning. And some people, you ask them, how are you today? Well, I'm alive. Uh, you ask some people, they have the, how are you today? Well, I'm blessed and highly favored. Uh, so we all kind of have our things that we say, but they can be repetitious, and they not mean anything to us anymore, right? If you're going to try to change what you say every time somebody asks you how you are today, to make sure that you remember that, that's going to be tough. You're going to run out of things to say. That's why I like to say, I'm extra good. Because I hear that in my ear. It reminds me to change everything to extra good. Not okay. Not I'm alive. Oh, I made it another day. Extra good. What does God deserve? Your very best. And it's hard to stay in those places, especially when you're sick or your back hurts or something going on. You just don't see it. You just don't see it. I just don't see evidence of it. Uh, you have to remind yourself. He has made promises, and he is faithful to keep them to the ones that love him and trust him and believe in him. Amen? So in James chapter 4, verse 13 through 17, this is something you, probably all of you have heard it. It says, now listen, and what does that mean? Now listen. You who says, today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city and spend a year there and carry on business and make money. How many of us do that? Yep. I'm going to take that job. I'm going to go there. I'm going to do this. We make our plans, right? Is that bad to make plans? No. What's your plan B? This should be your plan B. Plan A is the end of this. Why do you even, what, why? You don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that as it is, as it is you, are, uh, you boast in your arrogant schemes. Would you ever think that that was a scheme to make a plan? You know, it is. It's without God. It's, it's this is what I want to happen. All such boasting is evil. If everyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. What does that mean? If you know the good you ought to do and you don't do it, it is sin for you. What can that be? If you had a list, what would be at the top of that list? 
uh, it's not the same for everyone. Some, it's, it's money. Oh, I, I hold on to that. That's my baby. Um, some, it's career. It's their job. Some, it's their house. Their ambitions for a bigger house. More, more, more. So all those things can be your own devised, your own schemes, not led by God, but led by what you want and what you're, you're expecting out of this life. And it's sad to say, but the people who had their house burn up, that's what all of it's going to do. We don't know when that's going to happen. Uh, at the end, everything's going to burn. All the possessions that we stock up. All the time that we spend. Our souls. Now this is. I wrote this but. I, I don't know. I want you to feel it. Our souls. Your souls. Are continually in your hands. Now. We think. No. Because I commit my soul to the Lord. And we sing songs of that. But your soul is continually in your hands. See, we think sometimes God's in control. God's in control. He's got it all. And He does. And He is. But you control yourself. And your soul is always in your hands. You can do right. You can do wrong. Like that last verse. You can, the things that you that you know that you're supposed to do when you don't do them, they're considered sin. So if I know that for my soul, I need to be this certain way, I need to act this certain way, I need to live this certain way, and you don't do it, that's sin. Very simple. That's not condemning anyone or saying anything. It's just very simple, cut and dry. Can you guys understand that? It's very simple. But we make it so complicated because we add, well, what about this? And if I don't do that now, I, I always, for years, we had a business and we had employees. And I felt, I always tried to run our ministry and everything I did like Paul did. Uh, I tried to work along with everyone and, and try to be as Christ-like to people as I, as I could. And often that didn't work being the boss. Very often that doesn't work being the boss. You have to push people. You have to keep them going. You have to say some mean stuff every once in a while. And you have to fire people. And it doesn't feel good. But you know that you, I was thinking to myself, this is my ministry. This is my business. This is my ministry. If it wasn't for the Lord giving me what I have, and the Lord giving me this business, and the Lord giving me this truck, and the Lord giving me this trailer, and this equipment to do this job, these guys wouldn't have a job, and their families wouldn't have food. And when you think about things as a ministry in that way, and you start to, you start to add up how far it spreads out, it'll surprise you. That's what it's like to have a mind of doing things unto the Lord. And... I'm not bragging on myself at all because I fail a lot. I fail at all the jobs I've ever had. Um, I fail a lot. I fail as a husband. I fail as a son. I fail as a dad. Uh, I fail as a friend. But if I know that and I try to stop doing that, see, now I'm changing the path of my soul. I'm trying to nourish my soul. I'm trying to fill my soul in a way that pleases God. It's a, little adjustments that we can make uh, to make this work. In uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 18 through 21. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barn build bigger ones my barns and I'll build bigger ones and there I will store my surplus grain and I'll say to myself you have plenty of grain laid up for many years take life easy eat drink and be merry is this what retirement looks like 
Because if you study the Old Testament, there's no retirement. You just take a lesser job. You're still working. You still have something to do. In the, in the kingdom, you don't retire ever. You continue working. You may not be lifting and doing as heavy work, but you're always working. Uh, even if you don't have a voice. Take it easy. Telling yourself, take it easy. I've done it. But God said to him, you fool. How many times has he told me that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then, who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be when whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards the Lord, towards God. So you can store up a lot of worldly things, but if you're not rich towards God, the scale is way out of balance. The scale of judgment, right? You have to weigh those things out. And it's hard. I, there's no, there's no uh, formula that says, okay, this is how you do it. Uh, tithing. There's no formula that says this is how you do it. We've been in classes with the ranchers who get paid once a year with uh, contractors who had big businesses and they get a chunk to, to do a house, to build a house. They get a payment to build the house. They get payments, installments, and when it's done, they get a payment. What do I tithe off of? That was his question. A rancher, I only get paid once a year. How do I make this work? And so everyone has to figure it out for themselves. But we have to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. That means even though I have my wife's hand to hold, I personally am going to have my own fears and tremblings. I have somebody to rely on, somebody to do things with. But we each have our own battles with things. Amen? So we think that tomorrow belongs to us a lot of times, right? Especially when you're young. Ah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look like this forever. I'm going to stay young and I'm going to do them, you know. You start to get older and you're like, wow. Uh, I used to jump up playing the guitar practice time before my knee. I'd jump up on the chairs and everybody's trying to practice and everything and I'm goofing around running on the chairs, jumping off a stage like I was a teenager playing in a rock band. And now it's not going to happen. I look at that chair and go, I really, my heart wants to, <clears throat> even though Deborah's going to get mad, but I just can't do it anymore. I can't do it. There's uh, memes going around about 40 years old, and you start to be in the back of the truck. You remember when you were in your 30s and you just jumped off the tailgate? comes a time where you yeah you don't do that no more all right so we think we own tomorrow now in verse 43 here in Matthew 24 it says understand this which what does that mean if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would have not let his house be broken into. And, and when Jesus is saying that, he's saying it very plainly for everyone to understand. If you, if you have something that's important to you, protect it, right? Okay, so if it's your house, protect it. Uh, if it's your car, you protect it. Uh, you buy insurance for things that you think are important to you, and you keep them protected, right? So everything that's important to you, you're going to keep protected. Now, if you knew somebody was going to come rob you, you're going to have four watches. Okay, you take first watch, right? You're just going to be watching. You're going to be listening. 
for all the noises and creaks and you're going to be checking all the corners, you're going to be in the yard, you're going to have the cameras on, you're going to, have, you're going to be watching out for this thing, right? Because you want to protect your house. I want to tell you today, your soul is your house. Your soul is what you need to protect. Jesus is saying this in the form of a house because he wants you to understand this is an important thing. If you knew when somebody was coming to take it, you would protect it. If you knew when your soul was going to be taken, you would protect it. We don't know that. How do you protect it? Well, there's certain things you have to do. There's a certain way you have to live. Just like protecting your house. There's certain things you have to do. Uh, those things are on your mind. Because as men, we're protectors. As women, you don't want to mess with a woman and her children. Right? They protect that. Your soul is the most important thing that you have. Why do we not protect that? So, if we knew the time, we knew the place... We'd be listening, we'd be watching, we'd be ready for that person to come in the window. Because we know that Jesus said he comes quickly, we'd be ready for him to come in there. If it was a robber or if it was Jesus, both of them would get a warm welcome, huh? Amen? They'd get tuned up. Yeah? No? <clears throat> We got to watch for Jesus the same way, with the same strength. When we uh, we look here at verse forty four, he continues on in verse forty four, and he says, "So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him." So when is that? Nobody knows. So what is this whole, what is Matthew writing this whole chapter with words of Jesus written in red? What is he telling us? Be ready. In verse 4, he says, watch out that you're not deceived. In verse 6, do not be alarmed. Uh, Great distress is going to come. Watch for these things. He's giving us all the information we need. Uh, everything we need to do. Everything we need to be aware of. And why is it so hard? Because we don't know when it's going to happen. And we talked on Thursday. How many of you have been since you were little. Hearing that Jesus is going to come back. And you put your age number to whatever that is, and you go all my years, and he hasn't come back yet. What happens to you after you start to do that? Why do you think he wrote, or why do you think he spoke to John, and John wrote down in Revelations, return to your first love? Because when you first become a Christian, you get excited. You're on fire for this thing. And you want to tell everybody, and sometimes you want to just speak about that's the only thing you can talk about. And people say, oh, I'm so heavenly minded and no earthly good. Can't say, can't, can't ask him how he is because he'll start quoting scripture and want to talk about Jesus. And I just want to talk, how are you doing? You know, and people get like that, just on fire for the Lord. And then he goes away. All of us have gone through that and have been saved for a long time. It goes away. This is not happening as fast as I want it to happen. Uh, this Things are not going the way I want them to go. Amen? Is anybody with me on that? So, in verse 44, he tells us we must be ready because we do not know when to expect him. And in John, chapter 14, verse 1 through 4, I wanted to share this. In Do not let your hearts be troubled. 
Don't do it. You believe in God? Believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms, and if it were not so, I would have not told you that. I am going there to prepare a place for you. So, if you study the traditions, the Jewish traditions, whenever a marriage was happening, the, the bride was told to be prepared, and the bridegroom would go and... Uh, build on to his father's house. Father's house had the kitchen, had the place where they eat, and all the stuff there, and all the amenities was there on the father's house. Now the the groom would go and he would build onto that house. Everything still being with the father because if he's the oldest, then he's going to now occupy as the as the uh, as the lineage goes down. But he goes and prepares a place for his bride. And him to, to start their lives. And then he comes back when that's done. And he doesn't send a letter. Nowadays we have all this warning signs. All this electronic stuff. We, can, we have the mail. The Pony Express. Right? We have all these things where we can get a message out. I'm coming. I'm coming over now. And that day it was not so. Whenever that house was done, whatever time it was, the groom came for his bride. Be ready. That was her job. Be ready. From the time you know he went away, you don't know how long it's going to take. Be ready. Don't worry about when. Just be ready while. This is the same thing that's going on here. This is why he tells us this. So we can understand this. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you. To be with me, that you may also be where I am. Is that a promise that you just should hold on to? To be with the Lord. That's what he's struggling for. He wants to dwell with us. It's going to happen. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Do you guys know the way to the place where he's going? Yeah, he is the way, right? And uh, we talked about on Thursday, we talked about Paul. Uh, he was sending out letters and telling everybody ahead of time, find the ones that walk in the way. Let me know who they are so that when I come, I'm going to bind them and I'm going to drag them to Jerusalem and then we're going to stone them and we're going to get rid of these folks because that's what his life was, pursuing and persecuting Christians, doing away with them until the Lord changed him. Man, when he says that I am the chief sinner, could you compare to that? Did you kill people who were Christians? Did you sought them out? Burn the places where they were meeting? No. Paul says, I am the chief of sinners. Because he knew what his life was. And he knew what the change was in his life had been. So that tells us a beautiful story. We know the place, the way. We know the way to get there. We know that that's the final place where we'll be. What time? We don't know. But we are being told to be prepared. Now, you see all this stuff going on in the world right now. You see the Lord. Uh, there, there's something happening over here and out in Africa and over there. And all this stuff happening in different places. And people are coming from this town. There's different uh, pastors from this town that are flying out there to... Ashbury or whatever that is, Kentucky, to go get some of that. Bring it back to my church. Okay? I want to tell you guys, I'm not down on the Lord, and I'm not telling you that that's wrong, but I'm just telling you, the Holy Spirit's everywhere. It's not just in one church. And when Just before, he was saying, when they say, I'm here, 
or I'm there. Don't go there. Don't do that. Don't follow that. In this chapter, God's doing stuff in this world right now. He is. You saw the Grammys. How many of you saw the Grammys? No. Yeah, how many of you have seen the aftermath of the Grammys? Or read about it, right? Well, they said, get ready to worship. And then they came out and did some devil worship stuff. Yeah. On TV. On the Grammys. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody from CNN, or so it's CNN, they text, get ready to worship everybody. And then they came out in all their red costumes with their horns and all the, you know, barely any clothes. And they did their dance and they sang their song, Worshiping Satan. Yeah, the Super Bowl, halftime Super Bowl. They did that again. So you, you see it blatantly right in front of your face happening. You know, it's been happening, but it was almost like you had to go find it. If you weren't looking for it, you didn't find it. If you didn't know the difference, you didn't know the difference, right? But now it's getting more blatant, more in your face, more right now. And God is pushing back. And God is doing things. What? What does that look like? I don't know what it looks like. But I know that I can't go somewhere and get a piece of God and bring him back here to put him in this church but I know that God can come to this church and he comes to this church more often than we even think or feel. He's here among his people. And he's doing things in people's lives. That's why we have our testimony time. Because we see he's doing things. The prayer requests that come in for people, we hear wonderful things that are happening after Blake's accident, man, prayer request. Blake's going to come here, and man, we're all going to be weeping. That, but these are the things that happen. Uh, and man, I, it excites me, and it should excite you too. It should show us. If you believe in God, then there's the opposite. There it is. Okay, off of that. All right, so 45, verse 45 of Matthew 24 says, Who then is the faithful, wise servant whom the master puts in charge of his servants in his household to give? You can look up tutorials. People uh, have written different things about this particular verse, and what they most of them come up with is they're saying that that's speaking to the pastor. That's speaking to the pastors. That's speaking to the ones who are over, because it says, who are a wise servant put in charge of his household to give them their food at the proper time. So that's a pastor. That's what they say. It's pastor. Huh? Yeah. Everyone. Okay. What's the food? The Word of God, right? And, and I'll, I'm just going to go off on this for a minute. Uh, in, in Luke chapter 12, verse uh, 41 and 244, this is the same story told by Luke. It says, Peter asked, now this is important, right? Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? Now, you guys should be able to see this and read the rest of that and then understand what Jesus is saying. Okay? He says, then the Lord answered, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for the servant who the master finds doing so when he returns. So a couple of things right there. When you, when you hear Peter's asking a question. So Peter already had a question in his mind. Are you telling this just for us? Or is that for everybody? And I believe he answers that question. 
right? Do you see that? Who then is the faithful and wise manager? How many of you were employees at one time and then you got that managerial position? Yeah. When you're an employee, you just go to work. You just do what you're told. When you're a manager, now you got to mess around. Oh, because Jimmy showed up and he's stoned. You need the body, but now he's stoned and he can't figure anything out. Jimmy, now you got to take up his slack, right? Somebody calls in sick. Now you got to do their job. See, it's a lot more involved. That's why you get paid a little more when you're the manager, right? How many of you manage households? Yeah. You, you're the manager of that household. This is what he's talking about. He's talking about managers of his church. People, the, the wise servant that is put in charge of his church. Okay? Now, you can read into that that that's only for pastors. That's only for deacons. That's only for, you know, whoever you want to say. But I'm telling you, when you look at this and you realize that the house is your soul and that the group of us is God's church and you are a part of that, you're as much a manager of that with your soul being a part of that as, as he's talking about here. You're, you're managing your part of God's church. It's a bigger picture. It's always a bigger picture. He's always calling us to come up come up. Out, he pulls us up out of the miry clay and then he keeps calling us up closer to him, understanding more, researching more, doing more, being more. What does he deserve? More than my extra good. Amen. So now this servant over God's household is not a lord, uh, not a, a ruler, but a guide, a guide to take you on the way, to show you the way, uh, someone to help you follow Christ. The, the picture that we see a lot of times today is that they're lords. They, this is my church. This is my idea. This is how this is going to go. And this is my ministry. And this is my setup. And you either come on here and get on the bus with us and go where we're going. Or put your thumb out and get on somewhere else. Because you're on, this is my deal. And... Uh, that's really dangerous. That's really dangerous. And uh, it, it's, it's, they're there to make sure that sound doctrine is going out, right? You're there that when you're sharing with someone that sound doctrine is coming out of you. What, what have we, we told that uh, in Timothy that the itching, people will be itching their ears and wanting to put people in line that will tell me what I want to hear. You know, that's everywhere, right? You can see that in churches all over. Uh, how many of you have been to churches that make you feel really good? But you stay really bad. And nobody's going to be able to make you do something other than the Lord. Amen? But you can follow... In the wrong way, the wrong person, and dang this thing, uh, the thing that we need to understand is that, that it's not a person that's going to prescribe new ways. This is a new thing that I found. This is a new way of worshiping. This is a new way of having church. This is a, you know, whatever they want to add to it. This is how we're going to meet the people. You know what? You read 
God's word, you read the four gospels, and you see what Jesus did for the people in their lives. Even look at Moses and what Je Moses did for the people in their lives. What did he do? What did Jesus do? He loved on people mostly. Corrected them. Loved on them. And went through things with them. He didn't build them houses or buy them cars or do all these things. You know, that's what we think sometimes. That's what ministry has to be. We have to be giving everybody everything. Now, this position where this servant is, it says to be give them the food at the proper time. Now, we discussed what the food was. The food is the nourishment for your soul, which is God's word. To, but it's giving it at the proper time. It's rationing it out. Not overloading you where you're like, oh, I can't figure this thing out. I'm done. I just, I'm never going to get this. I'm going to walk away from that. It's rationing out little by little. Sometimes I don't do that very well. Sometimes I just load a bunch on to y'all because uh, I got to get to a certain spot, you know. That's my fault. I'm learning too. I'm learning. Thank you. Uh, it's to lead and show Christ to people. Is that just for a certain person in the church? No. Amen. That's for everybody in the church. To lead in the way that Christ did and show Christ to people. That's every one of our jobs. In the discipleship class, that's what it's about. The responsibility that you have. You don't become a Christian. And now I'm a Christian, I'm saved. And now I got to go over here to be a disciple. I got to get a diploma to be a disciple. No, as soon as you are saved, you accept the Lord, you are a disciple. These things are expected from you. These things are what you're supposed to do. When you back out of them and you say, no, I don't, I don't think you're wrong. You're wrong. Because if this is what you're going to be, this is what you have to do. If you want a job, well, then you have to perform the job, right? Same thing. You have a job description and you need to know what it is. If you're not doing it, that's not for me to say, hey, you're not doing it. But if you tell me this is what I, I don't think I need to do this, then I'm going to have to tell you, yes, you do. Yes, you do. It's not just for one or two people. It's for everyone who professes Jesus as their Lord and Savior. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, I'm going to kind of get into what this looks like. <clears throat> Having confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority. This, this is tough right there. That word submitting to authority, man, I'll tell you, when you're young, that's like fire. You know, yeah, we're not doing that. When you're older, it's a little easier. But we can get really stubborn and, oh, man, I'm never. How many of you guys can't work for a woman? Put my hand down. There's guys that just cannot work for a woman, period. Can't have, a, can't have a woman as a boss. That's a bad thing. Because a lot of times in a lot of industries, women are better than men at doing things. Just the way it is. I can't tell my wife, I can't fold towels. I can't fold towels for the life of me. She'll just say, get away from here. You're doing it wrong. Go sit down. And then I go, yes. <laughs> and it's not just that. There's much more. I can't cook like she cooks. Uh, but in all those things, there's, there's so much that uh, we depend on other people for. Because they keep watch over you as though as those who must give an account. And that's the thing. 
you know, the, the teacher back there with the little kids, and the little kids get out of sorts. They get ornery. They start running around. They don't want to pay attention. They don't want to do these things. That makes it hard for that person to do their job, right? And we don't, we don't want to have that. That's not what we want. And it's the same idea. Do this so that their work will be a joy. Man, so does that mean that someone is lording over you or ruling over you or telling you this is the way it is? No. No, because a lot of times if you don't have to tell somebody and you don't have to yell at somebody and you don't have to do those things, that's where it's a joy. When you have somebody that's just following along, figuring it out, asking questions, that's important. I don't want to ask questions. I don't want to ask questions. I don't want to look stupid. That's pride. That's pride. Ask questions. Not to be a burden. For that uh, would be no benefit to you. So it's not a benefit to you to, to fight authority. And you figure that I would have learned that as a young man, but still... I have a hard time with it. You guys don't have to raise your hands or say if you do. Because I do. And I'll tell you. This is the work that is giving of this servant of the household. It's not one that's taking. Man, and when I say that, oh, stuff just rolls. Taking. How many churches do you know? Where the pastor is the richest person in the church. You can see him on TV. You can turn it on. You know. It shouldn't be that way. But they keep for themselves. Rather than giving to the people. And there's a lot of churches where. Being this person. You're supposed to give grace. You're supposed to give love. Not law. You're supposed to give Christ's doctrine, not the law. Putting people under the law is a big burden. So they dispense the food. And I wrote this down just to see if anybody follows me here. The job is to dispense the food for your soul. That Christ purchased for you. And for everyone. I, I had to weep a little bit when I thought about that. How many times I've held it back for myself. Oh I don't want to say nothing. I don't want to look like I don't know what I'm talking about. It's okay if I don't know what I'm talking about. Because there's people here that love me. That will tell me hey you don't know what you're talking about dummy. Sit down. Right? That, but uh we don't hold it back. We, we share it. And it's the food that nourishes our soul. At the proper time, he says. At the proper time. At the proper time. What does that mean? That means why there's still time. It's talking about the end of things. Warning about what, why there's still time. Do you know there's going to be a time? There's going to be a day when preaching will not need anymore when the word of God will be something that uh, is just knowledge there's no need for preaching it anymore it'll be something you know like eating amen to that man I can't wait <clears throat> I'll be out of a job Acts chapter 20 verse 35 I'm looking at this going, what am I going to skip? In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering that the word, words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, I could have skipped that, but you can see how that is the better of the deal. 
Any time that you are depressed, I have medicine for that. It's called go and help someone without asking for anything in return or expecting anything in return. That's the medicine that heals that because you quit focusing on me, woe is me, and somebody else. Used to be you could go to Walmart at 3 o'clock in the morning and go, wow, <laughs> I feel good. At least my pajamas a match. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna we're gonna go into uh, verse forty six and forty seven here, and uh, it says it will be good for the servant, for that servant when the master finds him doing so when he returns. Doing so meaning doing the job that you are given. You're learning your job description and doing it. When you're doing that uh, and the Lord returns, you're good. When you're sharing, when you're ministering to people, when you're doing these things in love, you're going to be looked upon in favor. Right? Okay. So, in verse... uh, 48, but suppose that the servant is wicked and says to himself, says to himself, there's where is that coming from? Selfishness. Says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. My master is staying away a long time. So it's okay to go to the bar. It's okay to do whatever I want to do because he's not coming back anytime soon. Well, there's so many things that's, that says that he, his, this prophecy is not fulfilled. This has not happened yet. This has not happened yet. Ah, it's, we got a while. Same idea. So what does he do in 49? He begins to beat the fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. Now, you have to think. Hmm. Why was he taking so long? Why is God taking so long at this? In Ecclesiastes chapter Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 11. When the sentence for the crime is not quickly carried out, people's hearts are filled with schemes To do wrong. Very easy, right? Very simple. Very easy to know. Yep. Well, I figure I got away with that one. I'll get away with something else. Maybe it'll be bigger this time. Maybe it'll be less this time. Maybe I'll get away with something else. And you have to think. When it says here, he starts beating the other servants and eating and drinking with drunkards. Did he start watching football? Is that what he did? In Psalms chapter 1, or Psalms 1, chapter 1, very first psalm, uh, very first time I preached was this. Blessed is the one that does not walk in the steps with the wicked, or stand in the way of the sinner, or take a seat with a company of mockers. Okay, so you picture this, right? I know. I'm sorry, Bobby. I just said football and he's making faces to me. Anyway, so you figure this. TV's on in the room. You're going through the room. I'm doing God's business. Oh, yeah. Well, huh? Oh. What does it say? What does it say? Oh, <clears throat> Does not walk in the steps of the wicked. Wow. Or stand. Whoops. Hey. Who's winning? Or sit in the seat of the mockers. Ah, he's got my attention now. Now I'm in all the bad places doing all the wrong things. I just wrote on there for Bobby's sake. Did he start watching football? (laughs) But that's the idea. You're walking through a room and the TV catches your attention. Right? Right? And you stop, and you sit down, and you're like, wait, I want to see more of this. I want to see more of this. That's how easy it is for us to stray away from the way. And uh, 
the thing that we need to think about is when he says that he drinks, eats and drinks with the drunkards. What, what I believe is the thing that I come up with out of this, reading commentaries from men who've been dead for years, is it's eating and drinking the blood of saints. Okay? Eating and drinking with people who have decided that this Jesus isn't coming back. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to live for myself and I'm going to do this and that. And they, just like Paul or Saul, persecuting other people. You don't know what you're talking about. And that don't know. There's lots of those that, let me tell you, the way to look at this is when you're talking about the verses before, sharing, giving out the food. Or holding it to yourself. Think about this. When you don't share. The Lord. You are taking someone's blood. On your hands. Because you didn't share. You know the story about the rich. Man in Lazarus. And who crossed the great chasm. And the rich man says. Can you. Tells Moses or uh, Abraham just to just to cool my tongue with a little drip of water from over there. And think about seeing over there on that other side. He can't get there. But that's they're having a beautiful thing going on over there. And I'm stuck over here and I can't get over there. I can't cross over. And I'm done. This is where I'm going to be the rest of my life. Go and send somebody to tell my brothers and sisters. Well, if they wouldn't believe the. Prophets, why would they believe somebody that comes back from the dead? <laughs> but the idea is you don't want to be standing in a place and see the other side, the separation from God, and see a waitress and go, I, I used to go there every day, and I never told her. So she could be over here. Or I never told that cashier at the Walmart so she could be over here. And, and that is taking someone's blood on your own hands because you didn't deliver the message. That's harsh. It's really harsh. But it studies out. If you tell someone and at the end telling them if they refuse, and you say, well, I have told you, your blood is on your hands. It's on their hands. It's not on you. You did your job. Right? Okay. I'm going to jump all the way to the end of this. When the, the master comes in verse 50, the master comes, the servant uh, will on that day not be expecting him. And he will be cut to pieces and assigned a place with the hypocrites. Where's that place? Jesus has been talking to the hypocrites the whole time, all the way through, hasn't he? He's been talking to the hypocrites. Being assigned a place with the hypocrites on the other side of the chasm, in that place where you cannot be around God, but you can see everything that's going on over there. Hell. That's where you'd be assigned. Cut them in half. You figure... Abide in me. He says, if you abide in me, I'll abide in you. Every branch that does not have good fruit will be cut off and thrown into the fire. Same thing being told in a different way by John. It's a beautiful thing for him to come back. It's a beautiful thing for us to be with him. But there are those out there that this is the most terrible, terrifying thing that they ever could imagine. We don't want to let them go in the place. We believe that he is going to return. It is easy to pull someone down off of a chair. And it's a lot harder to pull someone up. 
And we often don't realize that we don't need to pull them. We just need to speak. We just need to show with our lives. Amen? All right. In John chapter 12, verse 25 to 27, we'll try to end this up here. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. We've talked about this. While anyone who hates their lives in this world will keep it for eternity, following him. And where I am, my servants also will be. My father will honor the ones who serve me. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No. It is for this very reason I came for this hour. This is before he's going to be crucified. He knows what's going on, right? In our lives, we have to remain the same. We have to understand that some of the things we're going through is the very reason why we're here. How are you going to react? How are you going to how are you going to be? What is God going to see when he looks at you? John, very last one, John 17, verse 1 through 4. I'm sorry, you guys. After Jesus said this, he looked up towards heaven and prayed, Father, this is the hour, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all the people that he might give eternal life to those you have given him. He has been given you. And he wants to give you eternal life. That they know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. I have I have brought you glory on this earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. I want to finish with this. This is when Jesus realizes that he finished the work that the Lord gave him to do. Now I want to tell you guys. He finished that work, but there's still people that are sick. There's still people don't know the life they could have, the eternal life they can have with Christ. There's people being born every day. But he finished the work that the Lord sent him. Now that work is passed on to us. And John says, greater things you will do than I. Not more. More miracles, greater miracles, bigger miracles. More because there's more of us. And we have more time. We should be doing these things. We should be sharing his word. We should be sharing his love. We should be telling our testimonies. Everyone's got a testimony. And I'm telling you, even if it sounds like a, like a, a played over recorded movie, you can still touch somebody's heart. If you said it a thousand times, how many times do you think God wants to hear it? As many times as you want to speak about it. If you don't have a testimony that what God's done in your life, man, come down here today and ask him to give you one. If you don't know the Lord, come down here today. We'll fix that. I just want to tell you guys how much and how great our God is, how much he loves you, how important you are to him. I'm going to close out now. If anyone needs prayer, or needs anything, you want to take communion before you leave, that's, we'll do that. I don't want to, sometimes I feel like people are going to quit coming back if you keep going this long. And sometimes I feel, yeah. 
And sometimes I feel like, uh, shut up. Just do what you're told. If you skip over this or skip over that, that's fine. You got the main part of it. So don't ever be discouraged by thinking that you're doing something that may be too long or may make people uncomfortable. Be encouraged because God, He is proud of His people. I've said to my kids for a long time, just do something to make me proud. How many of you have a kid and you're just like, just do something to make me proud? That's what God wants. You can take that for a lifetime, eternity. Amen? Let's pray. Father, God, we just thank you for today. We, we thank you for the lives that you give each one of us. Lord, we, we ask no No, Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus Christ on this little church. Everyone who is watching or hears this, everyone who's here, everyone who's ever stepped in this building on this property that belongs to you, Lord, I plead the blood of Jesus over them. Father, we just, we're just in awe of you. You keep us coming back, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. We give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, we ask these things. And the church said, Amen. Amen. I thank you all. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you were blessed. If you have any questions, please give us a call. 682-327-327. 7082. We are at 7955 Reed Road in Azle, Texas. Y'all have a good day now, you hear?